All right, hi everybody. Welcome to Back to School, uh, the phrase that chills the hearts and minds of everybody who has ever worked in education. Um, I'm Jules Bakes, I'm your moderator today, and uh, we'll start now. Um, I, I think we could do a quick introduction with the applicable work and pronouns, if you don't mind. Sure. I'm she, her. All right, go ahead, Jared. Hey, I'm Jared Green, he, him, uh, and my book is A for Effort. I'm Emma Hunsinger, I use she, her pronouns, and my book is How It All Ends. My name is Walter Scott, uh, he, him, and my book is called uh, The Wendy Award. All right, well, uh, very creatively, I'd like to start by learning a little more about your own educational and academic experiences. Um, can we start with Walter? Okay, so um, I didn't go to any fancy schools, I went to every crappy school, like I'm a product of a, like a public school education. Um, I, went to, I went to grad school for art, and uh, it was like the cheapest one I could go to. Like I, I, was going, I wanted to go to Bard, but it's like $90,000, so instead I went to like a regional Canadian university. Is that what you wanted? <laughs> More or less. Yeah. Okay, great, great. I mean, we'll get into it, obviously. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Emma, you go ahead. Uh, I went to public school in Connecticut, ooh, and I was never a really good student. I loved drawing too much to be a good student, <laughs> so I was always like a B. Um, I went to college in North Carolina, where I went from a B student to a C student, but then I got my MFA at Cartoon School, the Center for Cartoon Studies, where I was the best student I've ever been in my life, but unfortunately it was pass-fail, so I can't finish my career as a student, as an A student. I went to public school as well, all through high school, and then I went to uh, University of South Carolina. I studied criminology though, not art in any way, oh, in theater, um, and then uh, many years later went to the Center for Cartoon Study as well and got my master's in cartooning. What am I? What am I answering? <laughs> Sorry. Well, first, Anna, we'd we'd love you to introduce yourself with pronouns oh. and uh, your applicable work. And oh yeah. So um, my name is Anna Selheim. Sorry, I'm late. I was getting wheeled in. Um, I'm also taking this off. I'm sorry. Um, I I'm also an alum at the Center for Cartoon Studies. I was asked to be on this panel um, because I have done some comics about my education, but I'm currently an educator. I teach art and comics to refugees throughout Baltimore City. Um, so I have posted some work about that. I also have work from them here at the show. Um, any money they make off their work goes towards the student snack fund, but they liked my work on Instagram, so they invited me. Uh, yeah, and then what was the second question? So the second question was, uh, can you tell, tell us a little bit about your own educational and academic background? Okay, so I went, I'm from DC, I went to Lafayette Elementary from first to fourth grade. Um, I have a speech uh, processing issue, when, so I didn't learn to talk until I was four. They thought I'd be a terrible student. Um, I was actually an excellent student, except I can't spell or do grammar for anything. Um, I then went to the Charles E. Smith Jewish Day School for four years. It's literally down that hill. Um, I went to Duke Ellington for high school, which is not technically a magnet, but like a magnet high school in essence uh, here in DC for the arts. Um, and then for undergrad, I was dealing with major depression and also the fact that I didn't really know what I wanted as a career. So I was matriculated in three colleges and took classes at five because what would happen is I would go to undergrad with no idea what I was doing, miss doing art, get into an art program, and then decide, oh yeah, I don't want to BFA, and then would leave. Um, college was the worst uh, grades of my life. I, I generally was a very good student. And then um, I ended up with a degree in liberal studies, which is the most BS degree you can get. Uh, I got it because it was a three and a half, it's a three year degree I was able to get in four and a half years. Otherwise I would have had an additional two years of school to get a degree. And then finally I went to CCS and pass fail and it was a good time. Right on. All right. Um, so 
This next question I have actually been uh, coming to think of as the is Wendy you question. Um, <laughs> so you, is that the question? Yeah. <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. Um, so you all inhabit a, really a true spectrum as far as autobiographical content uh, is concerned. So there's Anna and your work is explicitly autobiographical in this case. Um, in this case, yeah. Yeah. Then Emma, your protagonist Tara in How It All Ends doesn't really seem to be an immediately obvious reflection of you, uh, putting a huge asterisk there. Um, then in between Walter and Jared, you both make pretty clever tongue-in-cheek allusions to, uh, <laughs> to the autobiographical elements in your work, like directly in that work. Um, and I'd love you all to talk about your relationship to the protagonist as you portray them or as they portray you, um, and maybe a little bit about the process through which they developed. Um, we can start with you, Anna. Okay, um, so the work that I'm on this panel for is really work about teaching my students. Um, I teach refugee youth uh, from four to 21 years old. Um, essentially, I go to a different school four days a week. So I go to, this is all in Baltimore City. I go to two different elementary schools. I go to a middle school and then I go to a high school. Um, and they're all out of the East Hall department. Um, technically I'm after school. But I hated children, and I <laughs> thought, oh, but I needed a career change, so I joined AmeriCorps. Micah has an AmeriCorps program for art education, and because I'd been an administrative assistant for 10 years, um, and then got fired for disability-related reasons, so I was like, time to do something different mm -hmm. after we settled out of court. So, um, yeah, and then I ended up loving these students. And what I realized is that, oh, I don't hate children, I hate spoiled children. And because I was a spoiled child, I thought all children were like this. Um, but um, yeah, it, I just, I wanna show, I think a lot of media depicting children really shows them as like brats, especially when they're interacting with adults, where it's like, man, like, it'll be like this child acting like a demon for 90% of whatever sitcom or book or whatever. And then at the end, like, they'll get him to bed and the kid will be sleeping in their crib and then the exhausted mom and the dad will be like, wow, this is what makes it worth it. And so, um, yeah, I just wanted to show my students being awesome because they're awesome. Yeah. That's great. Uh, yeah, so development. Uh, my main character is called Jay Violet, so very, very close to my name. Um, I have done a lot of like memoir autobiographical work and, and if you go to my table you can see like there's similarities between the two avatars of myself and of Jay. Um, but I think it, it developing Jay kind of developed when um, I was deciding like what was gonna go in this story and like changing certain things when it didn't feel like okay this isn't gonna be a straight memoir. It is heavily based on my life so um, I don't want to just call the character Jared and then have to explain like, oh, but it's not actually me and it's not actually all true. And um, so right, it like Kathy versus Kathy Guy's white situation. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a little easier to have some separation and to feel like, okay, like I'm making changes and I feel like okay um, uh, to do so. And um, but the the key thing for me was not to uh, have Jay have too much like present knowledge and and you know since I'm looking back at a, a younger time in my life not to just like he's like has all the answers and you know has it all figured out and has like you know easy solutions to everything but really trying to capture the like slice of life feel of like what did I actually know at those ages and like how is he like learning things and not just giving him like you know per perfect emotional maturity and things like that um, so, yeah. um. You're, you're right about my book being uh, like vaguely autobiographical, but not totally. The book I made um, came from an autobiographical piece called How to Draw a Horse that is about my first crush um, that ran in The New Yorker. And after it ran in The New Yorker, publishers were asking like, could you do a memoir? And my like adolescence was spent like either sitting in front of the computer, IMing people, or at track practice, and it didn't really make for like a compelling story. So I was like, memoirs out, it would be too boring. So I decided to make it fiction with sort of 
um, but pulled feelings from my adolescence that I really remembered vividly, um, which was nice, because then I didn't have to draw a book about sitting in front of a computer and going to track <laughs> practice. Yeah, I feel like I've been in a couple of spicy conversations since I've been here about whether there's too much autobio in <laughs> graphic novels. Um, and for me, Wendy is like a, an avatar of me, I suppose, but like I too am like a little maxed out on like autobio, and I suppose mine is in a way, but what's really great about having a fictional character is that like um, if I'm drawing from my life and my life is like, let's say, particularly messy, and like Wendy is enacting these like really messy situations, I get to sort of sneak out the back door in that way where it's like, well, that's not me, it's mm -hmm. Wendy did it, <laughs> you know? So there's ways that you can actually add things. Um, but also, um, like if, if I was doing autobio and like was as Fidelis as I, like if I was trying to be Fidelis to my reality and like put it on a book, like there's just things I wouldn't want to put in there, right. you know? Um, but like if it's Wendy, I can, right? Uh, so yeah, there's like freedom and leeway when you make something that's fictional, even if it is like based like pretty much on exactly everything that's ever happened to you. Yeah, totally. I mean, that's why historical fiction is a thing, right? <laughs> historical fiction? Yeah. Yeah, so people don't have to be too beholden to, like, research, right? <laughs> right, yeah. It's the same deal, but less messy. Well, sometimes messy. Anyway. But I mean, uh, like, uh, like, I'm sorry to interrupt, but no. Rob Klo is one of the organizers here, and he had this series, uh, the Sequential Art Workshop, about the history of comics, and he had this really fascinating perspective about how memoir is a genre, because even if you, um, even if you try to be as accurate as possible in your memory, you're still gonna misremember things. And if people see that, if they're in your work, they may not recognize it. So there's definitely instances of my comics where I'm kind of combining, you know, like condensing things or adding like a perfect one-liner at the end kind of thing as well. Yeah, actually, that's a good segue into a question I was going to ask later, but I might as well ask it now. Um, uh, let me get there. Uh, so I have a question about handling characters who are influenced or inspired by real life people. Um, do they play a role in your work or do you actively avoid it? Um, and if they do appear in your work, do they know? Um, are you ever worried about offending anybody? Um, Walter, we could start with you. Yeah, I've been accused constantly of uh, basing characters on real people. Like, I had an ex-boyfriend apologize to me for his behavior. Oh my like, gosh. this person's obviously me, and if this is how you feel or felt at the time, I apologize. And I'm like, no, it's, it's not you. And I look at the character design, I'm like, oh yeah, it is kind of him. <laughs> so it's like a way sometimes when you're making these stories to like emotionally process a situation. And if anyone is based on anyone in my book, for me, like honestly, this sounds like a lie, but it's just me maybe subconsciously making that happen. Um, there is like a moment where when I made my first Wendy zine, I like showed it to my best friend and she was like, oh yeah, I recognize everything that happened in real life, like in the story. Like I reckon, I remember that. And I was like, what do you mean you remember that? And it turns out I had like chronicled this love triangle that her and me and this like boy were in, uh, almost like to a T and didn't realize I did that, but she could see it exactly for what it was. And I was like, oh, whoops. But also um, it's, it, it was also accidentally like, this is like, not really, but then her and I went to see this Xavier Donat film later called L'Amour Imaginaire, and somehow it was the same story. <laughs> uh, but I didn't rip it off, it was just a weird coincidence. Anyway. Uh, I'm gonna go back through these books with like a fine tooth comb now and be like, is that who I think it is? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> I won't do it. Is that because I don't know you? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's I... not, that's what you're saying. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Um, I actually have a character in my book based heavily off of a teacher I had freshman year who was new to the school and therefore like a massive target for all of the lacrosse boys. Um, and I, did, I didn't, I was like, what if he does read it? I don't know, I'd feel bad <laughs> if he saw my perspective, which is that lacrosse boys were like constantly harassing him while we tried to learn about Charlemagne. Um, <laughs> 
But I think, like, kind of, Walter, like, what you were saying, you can try your hardest to hide it, but if there's, like, I don't know, I feel like there's got to be a percentage. If you put, like, 25% of somebody in a character, they're going to find it, and they're going to see it. So, and then you just have to deal with the consequences. Yeah, right. <laughs> Which, for me, I guess wouldn't be so bad, because my ninth grade history teacher isn't in my life anymore. Uh, yeah, for me, there's definitely... Um, some characters that are one for one based on real people, certainly my family members. Um, and, but then there's a lot of characters that are amalgamations of like multiple people. And, and part of that is just for like story clarity because it can start to get really, um, I don't know, out of hand to try to include like everyone you ever met and you know, make each character in your class like, and you know, have a moment. And then you're like, but wait, where did that person go? So. Um, I try to streamline it a little bit, uh, but then there's characters like the theater teacher in my in A for Effort who was based on the theater teacher that I had. And uh, I had shown him a version of the story a while ago and never heard anything, but then I sent him a copy because I'm like, it's pretty obvious that it's him. And uh, he, he really liked it a lot. And, that's, and the feedback that I've gotten um, in this book is uh, everyone really seems to like the theater teacher and um, the like, sort of having a, a tough, like a tough teacher who was also like very encouraging. Um, seeing that represented was really cool. So that, that felt nice to, to feel like I represented like the feeling I got from like him and his class. And um, yeah, and then my family knows that like, you know, I've changed some stuff, but this is like, you know, it's you basically. Um, and they seem to be okay with it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it depends on the situation. My students, for the most part, I never draw their actual likenesses. I don't use, I don't use their names. Um, I essentially will mix and match. Like, even though it'll be a specific situation that actually happened, um, even though I was talking earlier about condensing things, if it is actually a situation that actually happened, I will literally just swap students and come up with, I only use letters, really, um, for names. And also, I'll often switch countries that they are from, um, because we have, the big, one, the big countries I teach refugees from, they're generally from Afghanistan or, um, I'm sorry, uh, Congo, Eritrea, or uh, Sudan. So, but I'll just like mix and match those all the time. Occasionally I'll throw in like a third, you know, we occasionally have a student that's Iraqi, like that kind of thing. Um, when it comes to autobiographic work that I do that is not based on you know, students, but like adults that I care about in my life, um, I show it to them first. Um, you know, I don't think that doing art that hurts other people is worth it. Um, I prioritize the people I like in my life more than um, the art I do. Um, and honestly, a lot of the times they just make me change one line or something. It's not usually that big a deal because Generally, if you like me, you also like my comics, or vice versa. Uh, and then, if it's someone from my past, you know, like the same thing, right? Like, if your theater teacher hadn't gotten back to you, whatever, your ninth grade teacher. And then if I don't care about them, then they can go screw themselves. I don't care. I don't actually contact them and ask. Yeah. I support that. Yeah. All right. Some of you are portraying experiences that happened a pretty long time ago. Um, but all your work is centered on like a really great, authentic voice. Um, you know when you're like reading or watching something set in school and it's very like, hello fellow teens, like <laughs> just like obviously written by somebody who doesn't remember school or kids, <laughs> you know, uh, none of you have that problem. So I'm wondering, uh, how do you remember what all this was really like? Um, what resources have you used to refresh your memory? And Anna, um, for you specifically, because your experiences are so recent, and um, right. uh, your work requires like a real empathetic eye to catch the minute emotional nuances of your interactions with students. And I'm wondering, how do you keep that eye fresh? How do I keep that? Yeah. I don't know, I love them. It's very easy when you love your students to be empathetic mm -hmm. to them. Um, it's much harder when, I'm not usually writing about the kids I don't like as much, <laughs> um, or, or it'll be the same kids that I love, but they're doing something annoying. I'm not generally like, I'm not generally like documenting those moments. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I've learned so much from being an educator, uh, besides the fact that some kids are okay. But like, um, you know, honestly, my my big goal when um, 
drawing comics about these students is I want people to know they're like people first. And I want, that's also with their art. I think it's really important not to think of like refugees, the demographic. Like I want them to, these are teenagers or kids first and they all have super, like look, anime's forever and you got a middle school girl that's drawn from Afghanistan that came here like six months ago. She can do the best Naruto you've ever seen. <laughs> um, yeah, cause it's, that's, so like that's with their art too. I always wanna make sure that they have the space to draw what they want and Sometimes they talk about their experience with that, and sometimes you would have no idea, but yeah. I saw that Naruto. Dude, I know. That was really good. Oh, she's a prodigy. She has never even had an art class. That girl, I'm taking her places. It's fine. <laughs> um, as far as my you know, memory of that time, I mean, I was an on-again, off-again journaler, so I feel like sometimes when you commit stuff to, to writing when you're younger, you do remember it later on. I also have like all my old yearbooks, so like reading through messages and remembering like different uh, friends that I had uh, during my younger years. I have uh, middle school yearbooks and uh, high school ones. Um, and then I'm still um, my best friend from high school uh, who I met in ninth grade who was the basis of one of the characters. Um, she read early drafts of the book and she was like, I can't believe you remember some of this stuff. We're like, oh yeah, that person who we had class with. Um, so that was reassuring to feel like I was, uh, even though I had changed things and kind of streamlined the story, it, uh, it still felt like what that experience was like being in ninth grade. Yeah. Kind of like just a practical one, which is I just listened to music from when mm. I was in like oh. elementary school or middle That's school. Smart. Yeah, That's right? right. Just good. put on like <laughs> Sufjan Stevens, Illinois, <laughs> and I'm like... 15 again, and I remember everything I was feeling then. so young. <laughs> I know. I feel like it's really surprising how well we can, like, store memories in songs. Mm -hmm. And I still, it's, it's just, like, worked every time. It's pretty mm -hmm. amazing. Um, I guess because my book, I guess that we're sort of talking about Master of Art, Wendy Master of Art, is about my experience in grad school. That was only, like, five years ago. So it's, like, pretty easy to recall. And uh, I think my professors at the time even, they were expecting me to write a book about it. So I think they kind of like, didn't critique my work as much as they should have for me to get a proper education. Yeah. And like, it seemed like they were all like a little bit afraid at all times. But, uh, but you know, to the point of like memory or whatever, like when I started the series, I was like in my late 20s and now I'm like almost 40, which is, so bizarre to me, um, but so we were trying to turn Wendy into a TV show, uh, oh. which is not happening. Sorry, um, that been that's Hollywood, baby. <laughs> um, and we realized that we were all sitting around trying to write like the pilot, and it was like we're writing about this person like in their twenties, and like although like my life is not that different from my twenties, like for better or for worse, like I realized that like. Things have changed in like the 20s universe. Like 2010 is not the same experience as like 2024 for someone in their mid 20s. And I was like, well, she doesn't have a flip phone anymore. I was literally going have. to ask about this. I was like, mm. if you do fiction, how do you keep it current? Because everyone's got, like, I didn't have social media as a kid, I didn't have uh, like a uh, non flip phone. Like, how do you guys keep that accurate in your work? and make it feel real. Well, for the Wendy series, it's easy, because it's like she's aging. The right. character's aging as I'm aging, right. right? So, but like, the affect or like, the concerns of someone in their 20s is like, more or less the same as like, let's say, when I was in my 20s, but like, some of the particulars are different, and it's right. like, okay, do we give Wendy, do we make it a, do we make it a period piece? Mm. Like, is it Wendy with her flip phone in 2008? <laughs> yeah. Or do we make it Wendy piece. in her 20s in 2024? Right. Like, it's like, but she wouldn't go to a punk show anymore. She'd go to, like, an EDM. See, I don't even know. Like, this yeah, is, like... Yeah, no, right, this, right, is, right. this is this it. Is, this so is this it. is the kind of thing that, like... Yeah, I, I have no idea. Yeah, I remember um, struggling, because I wasn't allowed to get a phone until I was driving. Um, but then, because my sister drove me to school, I, w I ended up getting a phone in, I guess, in ninth grade. But it was just, you know, at the time, a flip phone. But text messaging was sort of a thing then so I tried to it was it was hard because it, it helps the story in some ways to like yeah how are the 
like kids don't really call on the phone like they no. like we used to or like using no. a house phone so there is a little bit of like cell phone use and i tried to just like make it as like brief as possible but and do you ever get tripped up on like the particulars of the technology where like you don't want to make a mistake where like some person's going to be like oh well that didn't exist then and like yeah so i would make like the messages kind of pop out of the phone mm -hmm. instead of showing what the screen looked like which some people do Sorry. in like more modern comics yeah. and uh you're like okay that's like um i messaging now or whatever but so for me i just had the message because uh, it was mostly just like coordinating you know, let's meet up or whatever. And so it didn't need to be like very extensive. Yeah. But I did wonder about that. I'm like, oh, cause I don't, I mean, it does, it seems crazy to think like 2000 and, um, 2005 or four was, you know, makes it a period piece. Right. <laughs> that period is but it's like, yeah, even can, even like social media with yeah. kids, like middle grade Yeah, kids, like we didn't have that. How you would know? you, like, I have no idea. So if yeah. I was going to do something about teenagers, like based on, like fictional, I'd be like, oh yeah, this is arbitrarily put in 2006. It's chill, we're off totally fine. Right, I think it's actually a barrier right now for like adults making work for mm -hmm. kids is that we don't really know what it's like to be 16 right now and like mm -hmm. being bullied on Instagram. And right. it's kind of, it's like, we can't make work about it because we don't know what it's like. And, and it would be nice if we could because then we could I don't know, have something to say about it or reach kids who are experiencing that. Mm -hmm. We have to ask them, like, what are the horrible names that you're called? Like, what do people call, e what do people call each other? Now? Oh, yeah, let alone the one screenshot. What, emo <laughs> what emojis <laughs> do you actually use? Yeah. Oh, my. Wow. You know. But then that's the road to making, like, really stiff feeling work, really. Like, yeah. The kid told me to say, Sigma, yeah. what the Sigma, so I'm going to put that in my feet. Yeah, what if they're setting you up and they're like, haha, it's all wrong? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, outside of, you know, extracurricular tech, like, there's also a matter of tech in the classroom and how yeah. things have changed regarding, like, Smart. school security. Mm -hmm. You know, like, a lot has shifted within the actual school mm -hmm. environment. Um, I think this is mostly applicable to Jared and Emma, but did did that play into how you approached this at all? Or, um, or did you actively avoid it? I, even? Because I, didn't, I guess I didn't consider it. Um, yeah, that's yeah. an interesting question. You know, it, I think maybe that is one of the one of the pieces of 2009 that got into this book <laughs> is that yeah. there wasn't that element. But I also think it probably depends too on what your school experience was like. Right. Like my high school wasn't very; um, it didn't have a big security presence, and so it didn't really make it into my book because it wasn't really in my memory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I went to a new high school. It was only a year old. Like when I went to my uh, high school and so yeah I don't know if I mean maybe nowadays it has things like the like bigger security and whatnot but um, back then it was it was still pretty small like the overall school was like pretty small uh, even though it was a public high school I think that's actually now that I'm thinking about it there's also a, a thing about comics and in the answer to that too right where it's like in comics, you have to be really intentional about what you're showing. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, your book gets really, really long and, and it takes forever to make. And so mm -hmm. um, I feel like if I did want to put like the security in the book, it would have to be part of the story, right? Because you have to be so economical with your drawings and your words that I could show it but if nothing happens with it, like mm -hmm. what does it mean? Why am I right. doing it, right? Why am I spending time drawing it? That's well, a great point. I, I just want to say as an educator, I mean, first of all, I went to a DC public high school and it was one of the safer ones, but we had security camera, we had security guards. I accidentally broke one of the x ray machines for bags <laughs> because I rode through it in freshman year. Cause I always, I had always dreamed of doing like the carousel in a, in a airport. Mm -hmm. So I did that and I accidentally broke it and they never gave me any crap for it. But, wow. um, uh, but we had all of that. We had like very strict rules about dress and like all sorts of things about like gang colors or anything mm -hmm. like that. Um, and so I think part of it is also like, I think the depiction of school isn't a universal thing mm -hmm. back then and now. And secondly, when it comes to technology presently, at least in Baltimore public schools, like past elementary school, you don't get paper anymore. Everything is a computer. Mm -hmm. And all the, all the students, I don't know about the students, but all of the teachers hate it. But what is happening is that you have a lot of people 
in public education that have never stepped foot in a classroom, but they're like, oh yeah, tech jobs pay a lot of money. So we're gonna all teach everything on Google Classroom, which is why like for my, I'm really, like I make sure that my program is one of the few places where you're not looking at a screen. Cause I'm one of the few places that like that's possible, but there's so many times where students are doing math and I have to scramble to find uh, like scrap paper because they're just supposed to do it in Google, uh, like Google um, Classroom. So, I mean, that would be like, I'm, I'm not saying you do you too with the middle school stuff. I mean, these like fictional books need to add computers to everything, but it's like they barely use paper anymore. It's crazy. It is interesting. I mean, it's something I wondered about with the predecessor to this book, AOK. -okay, um, the middle school I went to had a block schedule, and then my high school had a period schedule. Like that's those are two very different like structures for having school. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've had friends like a friend of mine who went to an all girl school in another country. Like she doesn't, she can't relate to my school experience. It was so vastly different, mm -hmm. and so. So in some ways, I guess I take it for granted, maybe. Like, I'm just, you know, this was my experience, and uh, hopefully there's enough, like, universality there in, in, like, what I'm, you know, not focusing on, maybe, like, the structure so much, but just, like, you know, the relationships of, with the yeah. teachers or students, and then that's the more universal part that everybody can relate to and not so mm -hmm. much, like, how different our schools were. Although I kind of find that interesting, too. Like, oh, wow, you went to a school that let you go off campus for lunch. Like, that seems, right. like, so bizarre to me because I never experienced that. Actually, that's a good lead-in to a question that you hmm. sent in, Jared. Uh, Jared had suggested an interesting thought. Um, how have you all gone about planning the classes and schedules <laughs> of the <laughs> students you're working with? Anna, this might apply less to you, but... Right. Um, uh, do they play a role in your work or do you... I mean, I only teach art class. Yeah. I have a particular comic um, where I make, I, I definitely have ideas of what I want as lesson planning, um, but I'm not like an art teacher where, man, we're really gonna learn two, three point perspective today. Like that's not, I'm not actually like their art teacher, I'm their after school teacher. So my big thing is I just let them draw what they want. I give them guidelines if they want it. If they want to do another thing, that's totally fine. Not all my students like art. If they want to read a book in the back, that's fine. They can chill and have snacks and read a book in the back. But um, yeah, and then I'll have intricate lesson plans. Sometimes the whole point is to make a zine. Um, so I have some of those at my booth. But also, like, I had the entire summer, I had so many things. We were going to make tote bag, we were going to make a logo, and then we were going to make a stamp of that logo. And then we were going to do all these other things with that logo, including, like, tie-dye t-shirts and blah, blah, blah. And I had written the rules on a giant piece of post-it note paper, like, like uh, you know, like a giant, like a board kind of thing, but it was a paper. And they're like, you got any more of that paper? And I spent the entire summer where they just over and over and over just every single day for class for a month painted on giant paper. And I just had to order a bunch more giant paper. And I didn't do anything else with the students. It was remotely on my lesson plan, so yeah. Um, I, for, well, so for me, um, the, thinking about like the schedule and the structure of the day at school was really helpful for um, in the early like planning of the story. And I got like pretty particular about, okay, what what is the order of the classes? Um, so for this book, it's a seven period schedule and like when when is each of Jay's classes and which of his friends does he share classes with? And then um, thinking about like what scenes are occurring at what time and like, oh, he doesn't have a uh, class with that student again. He's already, that class has already passed. So now it, if I need a scene with those two characters, it has to be the next day. So I have to make sure his outfit is different, things like that. Um, oh, that's super smart. So I, I, I tried my best to keep it all straight. Um, and there were a couple of, like through some edits and stuff, I had to make sure that it was all um, making sense. And, uh, but yeah, I found, I found it to be helpful um, as a way of getting started. Cause it's a lot of, you know, it takes a long time to put together a graphic novel. I didn't do any of that work. I didn't <laughs> think about um, the schedule at all, and I actually got a lot of copy edits about it, oh where God. like there was a plot point that ended up not working mm. because um, like I got the days of the week wrong. Mm. Yeah, um, but the best copy edit I got is that porta potty is a licensed trademark, and it's spelled with an I at the end, potty with an I. But still two <laughs> T's. Still two T's. Okay, I just an have to know. Yeah. Oh Were you allowed to use that name brand? 
Yes. Nice. I know. Thank you to the good porta potty people out there. <laughs> I know you're. I know you're here today, and I just want to extend my thanks. <laughs> Um, I think my work is a little bit looser in that regard. Mm. I have scenes of um, critiques of art, and what's fun about that is you get to make up these artworks, just draw this weird oh, yes. thing, you know, like a brick on top of like a, I don't mean, I don't know. <laughs> so, you know, that's, see, well, there you go. So th what, what panel is this? She, oh, that's her, um, this panel is her um, talking to a student, but she's extremely hungover. Yep. And She's running to go puke in the toilet. I don't know. <laughs> Has anybody ever wanted you to make any of the pieces that you invented really like that well, would actually it, work really well? I have this one in the book called Lacan's Table, and it's like a book of Lacan uh, embedded in resin in, in a table. And I was like, oh, that would actually probably be an artwork that somebody would make. Uh, Walter, actually, uh, Wendy is kind of unique in this situation because she appears as both a student and a teacher. Right, yeah, like the, what I had to do, yeah. Yeah, so like what could we learn about seeing Wendy as a teacher that we could not have learned about seeing her as a student? Well, in this book, she sees herself in the students, so it's like she realizes she's not young anymore, like at least, mm. you know, that's a thing. Um, and I mean, my experience, yeah, it is kind of weird being both a teacher and a student at the same time. Um, I feel really terrible for these kids, <laughs> like that I'm the one that's going to have to introduce them <laughs> to contemporary art. Um, yeah, I know. what was the question? Oh, uh, what could we, what should we be learning, or could we learn about Wendy as a teacher that we couldn't learn about her as a student? That she's just old now, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, one of, the, one of the things I really like about when she's a TA and a teacher is that you don't really show her not being disillusioned, right? Like, she seems disillusioned with art as she's trying to also inspire these other students with art. And I think yeah. that's like a really, not only do I think that's probably super common, but I think it's like really well done in your book. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> So this is a little broad, given what we've all said, but um, bearing in mind that sometimes uh, the character in question is you, to whatever degree, um, why did you choose for these specific works in an academic setting? Um, what does this setting support, or sorry, how does this setting support the specific story you're trying to tell or the ideas you're trying to get across? I can jump in first. Um, I remember when I was halfway through this book, I got like really, really stuck and really upset. And it felt like I was making something really stale and I was on the phone with my agent. And I was like, it's just another school story. <laughs> and she pointed out to me, she's like, Emma, kids go to school. <laughs> <laughs> kids spend most of their time in school. So like you're making stuff that's really relevant to them. And I found that to be really clarifying and like, mm -hmm. right, school is where kids are. The book is about the feelings and things that happen in school and that are sort of unique, um, that like uniquely happen in school. So I think like I said it in school because it's super relatable <laughs> to children and it, it's like it's where all this stuff happened to me and it's probably where all this stuff is happening to them. So yeah, it was a, it's the perfect environment <laughs> for a story for children. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I, I mean, with the theater class um, that I show in, in A for Effort, uh, I think for me what was exciting was to show sort of, because I was very shy when I took acting class and, and to portray like how scary that was at first, but then um, how much I learned from it and how like encouraging it was. And I didn't expect any of that going into it. And um, I guess for me, like, because yeah, everyone, all, you know, every kid experiences school, like to think like, oh, you can find like uh, a class that's out of your comfort zone and end up we're, like really getting something out of it. And I felt like that, I don't know, to be encouraging in that way to like, you know, try something new and, um, and even if you don't like it, you can, it, it maybe won't be the, the worst thing in the world. Yeah. 
Well, okay, I'll jump in. So my grad program was in a small town in Ontario called Guelph, and in uh, my book I call it Hell, Ontario. <laughs> and being there was kind of like being in uh, a cast of a like a like a film. Like it was like there was the lounge, and then there was the bar, and then there was the apartment that I was staying in. And like it just felt like it was the same thirteen people. Like we didn't make friends with any of the townspeople. Uh, we were all just stuck together, right? So it was already sort of like a built-in, almost like play or like movie. Like I felt like I was in like a movie or something. So making the book, it was really easy because it was like, okay, I'll just make these six students. They're all stuck together, and it's like a comedy of manners. So like, yeah, the structure was already built into my life to turn into a book like very easily. Um, and it's great too because then you could like hone in on each character and like really think about what each character is and then like play them off of each other. So, so yeah. And then I'm a teacher in a school. Yeah. <laughs> That'll do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I think we could actually uh, open up the floor to questions. Um, yeah, unless there's any last minute thoughts you guys wanna? Okay. Uh, there, there are actually microphones. Um, so yeah, if you could. <laughs> Makes it easier for you. Do you have to race? <laughs> okay, I'll go first then. Hello. Um, so this is a little bit of a repeat of a question, um, but maybe a little more specific as you talked about how you sort of help yourself remember what life was like um, back in the day. Um, and so my question is more specifically, do you have any advice for how to capture the voice of uh, kids and youth who, you know, are in a very different place in their life than you are as the writer? Mm. <laughs> this is always a, a tricky question that we should have canned answers for, but at least me and Jared <laughs> should. Um, but it's hard, it's hard to, I think the answer is that you, don't try to sound like a kid. You don't try to um, sort of like, I don't know, like take yourself backwards somehow and make yourself sound like a kid. I think actually you lean into your voice and your, and like what's really true and what's really honest about what you are going <laughs> through. Um, because kids, they like don't think they're kids, right? <laughs> like they're the oldest they've ever been and um, I mean, they know adults are older, but I don't think kids think they're smarter or anything, right? And so I think, like, if you write how, if you write with your own voice and you're just, like, really honest and, and don't, um, I think it's important to not to make things perfect and make things right and, like, sort of perfectly moralistic. Um, I think that is, like, a great way to have a lot of voice when writing for kids. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think sticking yeah to the truth of what you remember, and 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 like I said earlier, trying not to have too much like present day knowledge like being mm -hmm. put into the story. I remember there was a a note from my editor um, where he said like, "Oh, Jay's kind of like his response is kind of mean at this one point," and I was like, "Well, sometimes you're mean. Like, I mean, it's just it's not that he's like a mean character, but sometimes you have like a snappy response, and that felt accurate to that moment." Um, Give it, like it's a, a moment when he has a lot on his plate and he's really stressed and he kind of doesn't want to help his friend and it felt appropriate for him to not be very nice in that moment and I wasn't gonna it, you know change his response because then that to me didn't feel truthful. Um, so, but yeah, I don't I don't know that I do any like specific exercise other than yeah. Well, do, oh, I'm sorry. oh no, go ahead. I was just if you're not doing say necessarily someone that is based on you and your mm. experience. You just have to like talk to people and get to know people from whatever you're trying to portray. And whether that's just like, I wanna teach, I wanna, I wanna portray like, also kids is like apparently a bad word in education, I don't get it. But <laughs> youth, uh, like I have to say youth depending on the audience. Um, like if I have to teach my student, or if I have to, if you wanna do comics based on kids from another background, even if it's like literally just two cities over, you're probably gonna have to get to know some people and read up on it, and honestly, probably both. But, and this is, I think, also very important if you're trying to incorporate 
like diversity in any story of any kind, whether it's like racial or queerness or anything that is unlike you, um, like age difference, all that is a you gotta know, you gotta like meet and get to know people from all different kinds of backgrounds in order. It's also the way to have the best life too. So yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, sorry. One last thing. Jared reminded me when Jared's editor was like, this is me. <laughs> I think like one of the important things or to me, like the difference between kids and adults is like experience, right? It's like as an adult, we have so much more experience than children do. And so when somebody says something like a little cutting, I as an adult know like, don't snap back. That's going to make things worse, right? But kids don't know that. Mm -hmm. And I think that everything we feel as adults, like we felt as kids, we just sort of handle things differently. So I think even like the feelings you have as an adult, if you just record them honestly, like kids will understand them too because they, they're feeling the same things. They just like, they don't know what to do about it. <laughs> Very true. Thank you so much. Hello. 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 Um, this question is mainly for Anna, but it could, anyone else can answer it. <laughs> um, I am getting my MFA up in Boston right now, and I taught my very first group of high schoolers over the summer comics and animation. And it was extremely chaotic, but very fun. <laughs> <laughs> and my question is, like, what kind of piece of advice do you have for like new teachers that maybe you wish you had when you were starting out in your education experience? Well, so I will say that I kind of had an unconventional way of starting being a teacher, which is like I didn't go to any kind of schooling for it. Um, I had a quote unquote month of training, but like the head of the department was kind of on the way out. So um, some of the things, so you're, is it high school specifically or is it just in general? Um, in general. Okay. Well, high school is just uh, very interesting. Yeah. So high school is that like one, I would take their phones away. Uh, and I'm not kidding. Um, with, like, if you're teaching art to high schoolers, I you can have you can provide them with, if the school allows it, like iPads or computers so they can look up reference. But they don't need to be having their phones. Um, that being said, you can also incorporate things online into your lesson plan. Like, I know that the actual high school or uh, art teacher at the high school that I do after uh, school programming, and she's brilliant. And a lot of times she will literally just take a tutorial off of YouTube and uh, use it. Um, I actually use TikTok to explain to a Spanish speaking student, like I don't know English, she, I'm sorry, I don't know Spanish, she doesn't know English. We're kind of using Google Translate, but essentially at one point I just downloaded a demo on how to make a stamp and showed it to her and it was extremely useful and it's also 30 seconds versus YouTube, you know, they have the time limit. Um, and then, yeah, I, one of the things I also try to emphasize in art class is we don't make fun of each other's work. Now, if it's critique setting, that's different. Even though I've really recently found this like mode of critique that I find really fascinating where in art schools where it's you, you take the work as is and then you talk about what interests you in the work and what you like about the work and then the artist uh, uses that as they want and lean into that in whatever the way they interpret. And at first, I'm like, eh, everyone's like a giant baby that can't handle criticism, even though that's me. But it was fascinating when I was in, the, I was taking this class, watching all of these people start to make significantly better work just based on that idea. Um, and then for younger kids, one is take breaks to move. Um, like get up and stretch, um, you know, have a little dance party, not dance party, but like have a little <laughs> ring around the room or something for like 15 seconds. Um, a way to quiet them down is you start talking very quietly and then they start to be very quiet because they have to be able to hear you. Um, even though all you want to do is scream. And <laughs> the last thing I will say that I found extremely helpful is with young students is you all make the class rules together. So what do you think the rules of the class can be? And you know what, I'm a fun teacher, so if I say butt in chair, they're allowed to laugh because I said butt, and that's <laughs> fine. And then they all sign the rules. That's actually one of my first assignments is I have them create a superhero of themselves with a, with a like emblem, and then they sign the emblem on 
the rules so that we all agree to the rules, that kind of thing. Oh, there's some great images of those in your comments. Thank you. Yeah. I, I think we have question, uh, time for one more, yeah. Yep. Hi, hello. Um, my question is, when you're writing a character that's meant to be like yourself, how do you prevent yourself from just copy-pasting yourself into the story? I made it a woman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but also, people say, um, wow, you write women so well. I'm like, she's just a drunk gay man. <laughs> Drawn to look like a lady. Like, so there's a certain genderless anxiety that I think we all share that is beyond any markers of gender, let's say. But when you, um, strangely, when you make the character look like a woman, people are assuming that you're creating like, stories about women's experiences specifically, when I think we all feel like this um, sometimes. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I mean, I feel like that's a whole, like, maybe gender panel that I should be sitting on <laughs> that, like, this conversation is more appropriate for. But I would say that's, you know, one way is to just change the gender, I guess. No, I, I think that's really smart. Like, I do the same, you know, I occasionally do fiction. I wish I could do more fiction, but it doesn't. Anyway, uh, like, when I have a character that is very much distilling one feeling on a particular thing, or... Either I will change the setting and often change the demographics. It's like straight up and incorporate what I know about being that demographic, you know, whether it's gender or like age up or, you know, uh, like different kind of mix of race, whatever. Um, I will incorporate like that maybe in a tertiary sense, but really setting and, and demographic swap is a really easy way to like separate yourself for sure. Anything. I mean, visually, um, because it's semi-autobiographical, I did change some things. Um, like, you know, but but people still come up to me and like, "That's you," and I'm like, essentially, yes. Um, part of the part of it was um, more like out of necessity for all the pages I had to draw to like and color and all that to make it a, a more simple like avatar. Um, but yeah, I guess the, you know, it is me. So I don't. I guess in some ways, it is like. Copy paste, I guess you could say. Um, but then, I don't know. There is some kids like maybe a little more like mature than I was back then. Um, I don't know. It's a good, it's an interesting question. I don't know that I have a good answer for that. Kind of piggybacking off of Walter's answer, I feel like if you just change like one personality trait and give them like one hobby you would never have, you mm. could probably end up with somebody really different than you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. it could be Definitely. really superficial stuff that'll just, the character will start sort of writing itself eventually and it'll write itself away from your personality. Mm. And also um, my characters, I, I feel like they're all different facets of me. Mm. You know, like oh, I have yeah. Yeah, yeah. like Wendy is like the more art school oriented character, the main character, but then her best friend Screamo is like the party guy, <laughs> and then like her friend Winona is like the um, indigenous artist, and like each of them like represent a different facet of who I am, so it's almost like a diffracted sort of like um, parts of me all having conversations with each other is a way for me to work through my own like questions about my own identity or my own point of view. Mm. So yeah, like uh, it's kind of a trip to have like five different fictional characters that are all you in some different way. Interacting with each other, yeah. like an internal yeah. monologue. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure there's some like ther therapy <laughs> thing that like encourages you to do that. Awesome, thank you. All right, I think that's time for us. Thank you so much everybody for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.